Once again, it's time for the Team Lift Podcast with your hosts, Brandon Bowie and Roderick McDaniel. Let's go ahead and get right into the show. What up, everybody? It's your boy, Roderick McDaniel, and my man, Mr. Brandon Bowie in the studio. What's up, Brandon? Not much. All right. How you feeling? Pretty good. Still sore from the VR? Oh, she's fucking fuck the thing. God the VR is going to kill you. It's going to kill me. I'm going to have to start playing Elite Dangerous or something that you can sit down and play. Maybe yeah. that's what Oculus was going for, not releasing the touch with their fucking headset. They just wanted to make sure that everybody like that was fat like me can just sit down and play games instead of having to stand up and right. actually move it's, around. It's going to kill you. It's, it's going to kill me. <laughs> it's going to kill you. Gonna kill We're going to get into this episode, man. I, I always love this time of the week where we get together and we start discussing crazy stuff in the news. Uh, this is a little bit different what we're about to get into. I. <laughs> this is geek this culture based, PC based. I love this story because Microsoft has this shit coming, and I'm surprised it's just this one person who's won against them. But uh, So Microsoft, in their infinite wisdom last year, released Windows 10, and then over the course of the last year have been force-upgrading people's systems without asking them or getting permission from them, and in some cases actually tricking them into installing Windows 10 because they decided to make on one of the windows that pops up that, that says, hey, do you want to upgrade to Windows 10? If you click the X in the upper corner, they consider that consent to upgrade. So they were literally tricking people into upgrading and on top of that, just upgrading people, just saying, this is an update for Windows, and it updates you to Windows 10. Well, this poor woman... Uh, Miss she, Terry Goldstein. Yeah, Miss Terry of Goldstein. Salsalito, California. She's a fucking... She's a champion. So her she's system... She's the real MVP. <laughs> okay. So her system, her system was force updated to Windows 10. It left her system poorly performing, prone to crashing, and reportedly unusable for multiple days. Right. Um, so... She being a good uh, a good customer, she contacted Microsoft and said, "Hey, you force upgraded me. All of this shit's fucked up. Can you help me fix it?" They and failed they to help said her use no. it. No, they, but they tried. They, they tried. Just could not. They, do they, it. they they could not fix it. So she said, "Fuck you guys. I'm taking you to court. I'm gonna get some money." She pulled ten thousand dollars out of Microsoft's ass. Lost won the productivity. Lawsuit. She won a computer. lawsuit against them for yeah. ten grand. Yeah. And and here's what kills me. It said ten grand to get a new system, mm -hmm. and for lost wages. Yeah, loss of productivity, basically. I, I would assume is what they. What or yeah, lost it. compensation as well as cost of a new system. Yeah. So I don't know what she does, but her figure, her ten thousand dollar figure, reflected estimated lost compensation as well as the cost of a new system. So I wonder, like, did it? Did she have files on that computer that she couldn't get off? Whether comp, does she work from home? Somehow, lost compensation. It's, to me, that mm -hmm. term, there was something connected to that computer where she either earns money from it. She lost money. Yeah, maybe she's a graphic designer. I mean, she's from Seattle, so there's a possibility that she does web design or, or what have been. you. I, I don't know what something she does for was living, lost, but... but she lost ten grand. Uh, she was she was able to prove that she deserved that ten grand. She yeah. got that ten grand. Um, now Microsoft had appealed the initial judgment. But dropped the appeal last month. Yeah. Uh, now, a spokesperson for the company, I guess, told the Seattle Times up there that it denied any wrongdoing and had dropped the appeal to avoid the additional expense of further litigation. So, this really? is the other Microsoft, funny thing. Microsoft, really? Microsoft operates its home base is in Redmond, Washington. Right. So, I have a feeling that they decided to settle this and not appeal and cancel the appeal. Because they didn't want Seattle telling them you can't do this to anybody else ever. I think that's what it came down to. They, I think they were they were afraid of possible legislation by the state. Yeah, because this is in your backyard. Yeah. It's different when it's someone in your backyard suing yeah. you. This is a little too close to home. This is being covered in local newspapers. Mm -hmm. This is now a local issue. This is not. You're fighting Roderick in Austin, Texas. You'd probably send a team of lawyers down this here. Is, to take I can me drive out. up to your building and say hi, close, and, and I will make you miserable. Mm -hmm. And so I think I I personally feel I like I think they wanted to settle this before it turned into class action because I'm surprised the class action lawsuit hasn't happened yet. This is one of the things we're going to talk about. We've seen class action lawsuits. Remember the the big one in California about the 360 mm -hmm. and the failure rating on the 360. That was a class action lawsuit. Yeah. Um, which Microsoft 
Yeah. Pretty much lost Huge. that one. Huge. Never have seen the numbers that came out of it. The only number that they told, they never told how much they paid in it. The only number we ever got out of that was that 54% failure rating for the 360, and they knew it. Mm -hmm. Which was, that was pretty bleak. Imagine if you made cars, and more than half of the cars that you made never worked when they came off the assembly line. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, that, that's, um, first of all, you're not going to be in business for long. Mm -hmm. But we're talking if a car fails, 54% of the cars you make failed, and you knew they were going to fail within the first three years of it, mm -hmm. that there was a possibility that 54% of these are going to fail in the first three years or less. That's not a very, you, you basically beta tested your product on me. Mm -hmm. That's how it felt. Okay. And so, you know, that left a bad taste in people's mouths. This Windows 10, because of the business we work in, we've dealt with people who have been force upgraded to Windows 10. We know that it doesn't always work with some website-based games that use Java. Mm -hmm. I think I think that the the real problem is that Microsoft didn't have a decent upgrade path. Like they're they're force upgrading people to an operating system, and the upgrade process that they're putting them through to get them onto that system leaves the system unstable. Like when I first updated my computer to Windows 10, cause I did it, I was just like, I'm just gonna do it. I'm just gonna upgrade to Windows 10. I've gotta do it for work anyway. I need to know the system. So the, the day that it came out, I updated and I probably rebooted at least five or six times before I got the system to a stable point where it would actually work. And then within two weeks, I had just said, fuck it. And I, I told Windows, I was like, look, just kill the existing version of Windows that's on and reinstall yourself fresh and I'll I'll start over and I'll reinstall all my programs. I don't give a fuck because that's how unstable it was when I did an upgrade to Windows 10. Wow. On my mom's system, it was even worse. Like I walked her through the upgrade process to Windows 10. We wound up having to boot, reboot four or five times before she could even get desktop icons to come up. Like it was just god awful. So I know exactly what that woman's going through. It's not a fun process, and it's not something that anybody should be subjected to. Um, and realistically, i got to hand it to fucking Apple, because I've watched an Apple iOS, uh, iOS update, or not iOS, but um, a Mac OS update mm -hmm. um, on my girlfriend's laptop. She's gone from Yosemite to El Capitan, and she's going to move to whatever's coming out, and she's come from other operating systems before. Mm -hmm. She's never had to wipe her system. It just everything just works because they actually have a true um, client server architecture within the operating system because it's based on Linux. The core of the operating system is the server and you as a user are connecting to it as a client. So your information is completely separate from the core of the operating system where right. Microsoft is just kind of like a mixed bag. Like everything is all in the same space. And so when you do an upgrade, what you do to Windows has rippling effects to everything else that you use. Right. There's famous YouTubers who just aren't even going to upgrade to Windows 10 right now because not all of their tools work. Like Total Biscuit, he's still on Windows 7. He tried Windows 10, half his fucking programs that he needed to to just do his to daily. To do his show for YouTube. Just to do his Go. show didn't work. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, we, we kind of know it. And... It, it's one of the things windows has a hit or miss record. Mm -hmm. I think it's safe to say XP and seven were probably the most fuss free experiences I've ever had. But Emmy, you remember that cluster bomb? Oh, Jesus. Don't even talk about Emmy. You remember Emmy, Emmy is so bad that Microsoft won't even admit that they actually made that operating system on their own goddamn website anymore. Do they not? No, you, I, I've tried to find windows Emmy on the Microsoft site. I literally can't find it anywhere. It was terrible. It, it, Emmy was a cluster bomb. Uh, 98, if you were in retail, you probably had a computer that ran Windows 98. You didn't have a choice. It just happened. I don't mind Windows 98. I am uh, I, I don't hate it. It just, it is what it is. All right. So that was enough news about that. Let's kind of go ahead and move on. What we got, I want to talk to you about something. We kind of hinted at this on the last issue. Mm -hmm. uh, Supercell, pretty known. Pretty known mobile company, mobile gaming company. Mm -hmm. They've given us hits like uh, Clash of Clans, Boom Beach. Supercell's a pretty big company, okay? Um, recently been purchased, and they were not purchased for a small amount of money either. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it looks like the Chinese internet company Tencent, which a lot of people in gaming know Tencent. You probably heard this name. If you are a League of Legends player, you're aware of Tencent. Yeah. Uh, Tencent was the one that bought the League of Legends developer Riot Games. Uh, they also have a stake in Epic Games. Um, these guys are going to pay $8.6 billion to acquire a 84.3% stake in Supercell. Yeah. That's so a lot of stake. money for Clash of Clans, brother. Yeah. I mean, mobile games are kind of ridiculous. I, I don't understand the mentality of a lot of mobile gamers because they will they'll get into a game and they'll love that one game and they play it all the time and they will pay thousands of dollars worth of microtransactions and sometimes those same people are the same people who will complain about how expensive a pc is to start gaming on and they'll be i I know this no i i I know this know this for a fact that there are people near and dear to us we Mm -hmm. have friends that have done this yeah. that have complained that the consoles, mm-hmm. why am I going to pay $400 for a console? Then I got to go pay $60 for the game, you know, yeah. just so I can play online. Then I got to have my one year membership. Yeah. And or, I say, yeah, that's maybe 40 or 50 bucks. Yeah. But th- those are the same people who also say, you know, oh, I, I can't spend a thousand dollars on a computer. I can't spend $600 on a computer or $500 oh, yeah. on a computer, but they'll go out and buy an $1,800 television just so that they can watch the fucking news. Or they've spent three grand over the period of a year in a mobile game. Yeah. And we know they spent the three grand in these mobile games. I've we, seen it. You know, we've got buddies that have done this. Uh, we got friends near and dear to us. Microtransactions are... First of all, if I could make a game, mm-hmm. if I could figure out a way to put microtransactions in it, I would. I would microtransaction of everything to you. You don't like the guns in this game? You can buy this gun pack and get the guns you want. 99 cents a gun. Why have all the guns? Just get the guns you want to play with for 99 cents a gun. And there would be at least 400 guns available. And m- microtransactions, they are... They're the devil. We they, said this when they first happened. They're the fucking... Not only are they the devil, but they're being employed in, in the stupidest of ways. Like, they're being employed to refresh energy in games. They're being employed to to get things that um, allow you to essentially excel at the game versus somebody who's not using the microtransactions, which is dumb. Like It's a pay-to-win you, or pay-to-play. Yeah, as pay to win. That's, that's what I, I like to call it pay to win. There's the only there are only two versions. There's microtransactions that enhance your gaming experience, and you can still enjoy the game without having to pay. One of the games that comes to mind, if uh, you're familiar with it, The Simpsons Tapped Out. Yeah, personal favorite of mine. We know I'm a huge Simpsons Tapped Out fan. Um, if you go to the TSTO Addicts, a website mm-hmm. that you know, for fans of the game, they always break down stuff when it comes to the game. And they say, if you are a premium customer or a premium player, premium player means a guy that's going to spend money to get the premium item. Or if you're a freemium, mm-hmm. and that's, our, that's the two customer bases in this game. Freemium, I'm not going to put money into this game. Premium. And they break down new items when they come to the game. And they say, if you're a freemium player, a yay or nay against this new item that's coming into the game. If you're a premium player, yay or nay against this new item coming to the game. I love that website because they speak to both players. They don't just acknowledge one without dropping the other. I think The Simpsons does it right. You don't need to buy any of this stuff to win this game or to beat it. Yeah. But if you're willing to spend money, this is how it will enhance your game for you. I think a better game to say that about is Overwatch. Overwatch, another big so game right now. In Overwatch, there is a micro there there are there's leveling and the leveling as you hit each new level you get a loot box and the loot box is just skins or voices or poses or you know, things that are cosmetic. Right. That's the only type of item that you can get out of it. And if you wanna buy those loot boxes, it's a dollar a box. Yeah. And the the interface for buying those loot boxes is completely and utterly hidden in the game like it's really hard to get to um there's also games like plants vs zombies garden warfare 2 where it has the same thing you buy cash you use that cash to um unlock cosmetic items like anything that you can unlock in that game that's that that 
is uh, changes the game in some way, shape, or form is generally cosmetic. Yeah, it's nothing that I I could play this game and never spend two dimes in it. Yeah, and I've never spent a dime in in either game other than just the initial purchase cost of the game itself. Exactly. And yeah. I've enjoyed the hell out of both of them. Um, Garden Warfare Two. I think you remember when it first came out. I was spending hours trying to do all yeah. the snow globes and all the gold uh, known. So I was. I was doing a lot of the collecting and grinding of hours and playing a lot of missions. And what I think is really I weird it. is we're in this space now where in Overwatch, the only reason why it has loot boxes and a progression system is because people bitched that it wasn't in the beta when they first started doing the betas. People couldn't understand that there would be a reason to just play the game to just play it because it's fun and not to play it to level up and collect shit. I, I think, don't really do you understand. Think maybe that. we've been trained. I think that the generation since uh, the like the the millennial kids, the the ones who are coming up now, who yeah. are, who are in their twenties and whatnot, they've been trained by the last generation of consoles to expect there to be a progression system in everything by Call of Duty. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, whereas somebody like me, I I was in my teens in the nineties. I was playing games like Quake and. Uh, Doom and you know, Unreal Tournament and whatnot. And we just played the game to play the fucking game. We didn't play the game to collect shit. We didn't play the game to get skins. We didn't play the game to get hats. We didn't play the game to get sprays or whatever. I just played the fucking game because it was fun. And I played it all the time. And there's there's no reason for it. This is funny you say this. Because I was one of the guys when, when Premium came in. I had my kids were younger. I just didn't have Premium money. Okay, I wasn't mm -hmm. about to be spending money on some digital shit when I needed real shit in my house, like food, clothes, you know, shelter, all the adult things. So mm -hmm. my kids are all grown now. I'm 45. I will spend money in a game in a minute now. Something I would have not done several years ago. Yeah. I would not have done it. I'm talking about 2014. Yeah. 2013, I think around 2014 is when I started spending money in games. Some Somewhere about halfway through around June, June, July, that summer of 2014, I think I, I started putting a little bit of money in games, you know, yeah. getting a Google Play card and buying a game on the tablet and putting stuff in it. I got, it happened, you know. So I understand that. Like, I old school guys, you'll tend to find more people that are in my age group that are going to be in their 40s. Mm -hmm. mid 40s late 40s they're going to be the people who probably are going to lean toward not buying you'll hear that a lot i'm not i'm not spending money in this game i'm not about to spend money on this that's ridiculous yeah i can't use it then you meet the people who are you know you get comfortable you kind of got a little spare income maybe you don't go out and drink you know i really don't go out i don't drink i don't smoke yeah outside of my video game addiction i have nothing you know so it's like easy for me to justify the cost. Hey, it's not like I'm going out to eat fast food every night. I can afford to take seven bucks and spend it in a game on some digital content that's going to make me enjoy this game that I'm sitting at home playing anyway. Yeah. So it's definitely a different thing. I, I'm finding that kind of interesting. There's there's a different mindset. So microtransactions overall, I'm not a fan of them because there are a lot of mobile games. It's in there. You you have to buy it or you're not going to beat this game. Yeah. You're not going to win. That's pay to win. Yeah, and, and what gets me is if you're putting $8.6 into trying to buy Supercell and Clash of Clans and their Boom Beach, which I've played both, big fans of both games, you're, you're expecting to get that money back somehow. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you're going to get the money back, but you are expecting a dividend on your return. So when they're coming in there and they're doing this, and Tencent is a big company, man. These are not little guys. Now, this deal is expected to go through in third quarter of 2016. I think it's still got to go, you know, it's pending regulatory approval, and it will be completed in stages, so it's not going to be all at once. Um so we know there's some there's something going on about this. We've kind of been reading this through the Wall Street Journal. They were the ones to really break this story. But um, the total equity value of uh, $10.2 billion also recognizes the value of the phenomenal company that our people have built. That is what Tencent has said about this. Yeah. And, and over in Supercell. Um, I'm not quite sure how they're going to get that money back, bro. That's a, you, you're putting 10 
8.6 billion. And now I know Supercell did Heyday, they did Boom Beach, they did, uh, I think they're, they did Clash of Clans, their new game, Clash Royale, came out I, earlier this year on mobile. They're, they're getting into this position, it seems like, where they're trying to, uh, where Tencent is basically trying to be a mobile publisher that's on the same level as like Activision and Electronic Arts. I mean that's that's basically the try the position that they're trying to get into. They're they're trying to gobble up companies that um, work in the mobile space, mm -hmm. and then more than likely you're gonna they're gonna probably start just gobbling up lesser developers to acquire their games and to you know bring them into the fold so they can keep making money. They're just they're gonna building be building a, a nice library of hits though. League of Legends. Yeah. I mean, let's let's face it, still a pretty rabid following for that game. Speaking of League of, League of Legends, just recently, um, I believe it's in Korea, Overwatch overtook League of Legends as the most popular game. That's a statement. Yeah. And now I don't know if a lot of people are familiar with it. There's actually um, gaming's big in Korea. Huge. G gaming is infantile in the U.S. As many billions of dollars as it generates in the U.S., it is infantile based on the Korean gaming community so and market. Korea is essentially th think of any sports legend that you have here in the states like joe namath or what have you the michael Football, jordans michael are, jordan are you name any of anybody. our legend sports characters there's a korean equivalent that's a gamer like yeah. that's that i like to think of it like this there's a book by ian e. m banks called the player of games mm -hmm. and in the player of games there's this entire society who is based on gaming like their king is the guy who can play this game that they have in their society the best mm -hmm. um and if you enter that society and you can beat the king you become the new king mm -hmm. that's korea <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's their true. gaming that's that's it like when i describe that game or that that book to people i'm like it's like if korea <laughs> if if you were the best at StarCraft or you were the best at League of Legends, you got to run the country. That's essentially what it is over there. And it is huge. And, you know, they have, I mean, these guys are generating money. Mm -hmm. These guys are living like rock stars. Yep. People pay tons. Like what people pay for money to go to the Super Bowl here, you will pay to get tickets to go watch teams battle it out in StarCraft over there. Yeah. So this whole... The whole competitive gaming market we owe to Korea. The U.S. is trying to get in on it. I mean, we got it somewhat with MLG, but it's nowhere near as big as what is going on right now, present day in Korea. Yeah. And now Overwatch is the most popular game there. And this is a country where we know League of Legends has been dominated. Uh, we know what is that it about, StarCraft was there. Huge. What is it about Blizzard games they and Korean... Like, does Blizzard just like know exactly what the fuck is going on in Koreans' heads and and what they want to play somehow? It sure seems that they do. I mean, I mean, I know they know what I want to play here in the states. But like, they just... really seem to have a pulse on. I mean, there's just when it comes to the whole. I'm not a MOBA fan. Okay, I'm not a MOBA fan either. I'm not a big MOBA fan, so that whole idea of MOBA is just kind of eh, miss me. But man. They, they seem to have their finger on the pulse of the hottest games mm -hmm. when they're getting ready to come out. And Tencent is trying to follow in that path because they wait till you make these things that generate a lot of income mm -hmm. and have generated and sustained income over a long period of time, and they are snapping you up. And they're, spend, they're not scared to spend billions to acquire you. $8.6 is not a number you sneeze at. I mean, that's $8.6 that's what... Six point six billion more dollars than Facebook paid for Oculus. Thank you. Yeah, that was four hundred million in cash and then one point six billion in stock. That was Facebook acquiring Oculus Rift. And this is this is just a developer that makes a single game. Yeah. Well, okay. So we know that this is all Supercell is just mobile games. That's yeah. all they do are mobile games. Yeah. Now, heyday. We kind of knew it was like one of them little matching games, you know, kind of like the Candy Crush crap. Mm -hmm. And and it did really well. It did really, really well. I mean, it had commercials on TV. I used to see commercials for Heyday, and I'd be like, what the hell is Heyday? Yeah. Get it now on the iTunes store or Google Play. And you'd see this commercial for Heyday, and I'd be like, people, mm. people are really going to do that? Then I saw the commercials 
You know, and this was back about 2013, 2014. You were seeing the commercials for Candy Crush, which was owned by King Games. Uh, there's even commercials for Boom Beach. I've seen commercials for Boom Beach. I never really... I went, There was the Clash of Clans commercials where the guy would be riding the uh, pig mm-hmm. and the skeleton. So, I mean, we've seen commercials for it. But what got me was that this is the kind of money that they're throwing behind these mobile games. It's definitely going to be something I think we need to... If, if there's any way we can get stock in 10 <laughs> it might 10 be cents, a good time to buy, yeah. We might need to watch these guys over the next couple of years. I think they're doing some big stuff, and we need to be on that. We need to be on the same page and pulse with these guys. Um, what else we got going on, man? Any news in the, in the the on the VR front? So there was some interesting stuff that happened on Reddit. Um, one of the guys from Valve, um, he's one of the developers there, he actually stated that, at the moment, at least a third of Valve staff is is doing something that is VR related or is working in the VR space. Whoa, that's a big number. I mean, that's a company. It's not a very big company. It's it's a privately owned company. Right. Um, there's, I, I would say probably about 140 employees, maybe, and a good chunk of that, a third of that, is probably all is just making VR stuffs. So what could they be working on? Could it be Half Life Three? Dun dun dun! No, but I think we're so ready. <laughs> it's Every, it's so, never gonna happen. Yeah, it's never I think, gonna happen. I think we're at the point where you know. I think the problem is, I really do believe. Like one time, Gabe Newell came out with an article. I want to say it was 2013, 2012, and I remember one time he said, "Every time somebody asks him, it pisses him off more, and he feels like he wants to push it back a few more years." Um, I would be so mad if, like, Half-Life 3 has been done for years and we've just pissed this man off so much that he shelved it. I, I don't think it's that. I think what it is is they they tend to work on projects. Because Valve is not like any other company. They they have a flat structure. Like, and they're, there's no bosses. Like, everybody is autonomous and everybody works on what they want to work on so long as what they're working on is for the good of the company you know so if if there was a consensus of valve if like i don't know 60 or 70 people all said we're gonna work on half-life 3 i'm gonna do this you're gonna do that or i'm gonna do this and then somebody else says okay i'll do this and somebody else says okay i'll do that and the project starts to gel then they'll do it and I think that's the problem is like they've they've been working on other things. They've been working on Dota. They've been working on Team Fortress 2. They've been working heavily with HTC on the Vive. I mean, they they created the Vive in-house. They they had everything for the Vive. It was all done by uh, Michael Abrash and his team at Valve when they started looking into AR and VR and research and stuff like that for mm-hmm. the VR platform. Um, the guts of the Vive are basically almost exactly identical to the guts of the Oculus Rift because Valve actually went to the Rift headquarters before they got acquired by Facebook and they installed the uh, prototype of the Lighthouse system that had a bunch of um, QR codes on the walls and things. So Oculus is... Uh, a lot of the technology that's in the Rift came from research that was done at Valve and Michael Abrash after uh, Facebook acquired Oculus Michael Abrash left Valve and went to Oculus and continued to work there on VR so that's it the difference between the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive is not really all that different like the tracking system is the main thing that's different between the two things Mm -hmm. one has an internal tracking system and one has an external tracking system so on the the Vive, you have all the dimples that are on the front of the controllers and on the front of the headset. Those are sensors that are looking for light, uh, infrared light that's being sprayed out of the two lighthouse boxes that you put up on your wall. And it uses that as orientation and tracking data so it can figure out where it is in a 3D space. The Vive, or the, the Oculus Rift works the exact opposite way. The Oculus Rift's headset throws light out infrared light out like the like the lighthouses do Mm -hmm. so imagine you have lighthouses strapped to your face and then instead of um them receiving things on the headset like the vive does a camera that senses uh infrared on your desk picks up that light and then uses it to create tracking data ah okay so that's the main difference between the two but um 
I, I it, it's it's so interesting as to how close they are, mm-hmm. but how apart they are. Like I think that if uh, Facebook had never acquired Oculus, that the company would definitely be poorer, but I think that they would be better as a company because after Facebook got its hooks into Oculus, that's when everything started to just get weird. Everything has gone wrong for them since. I mean, not gone wrong because they're not... To me, it's, uh, the reason I they say have... gone wrong is, let's face it, they're getting outsold right now by the Vive. We've discussed this. Yeah. It's not even close. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's discouraging mm-hmm. how big a difference it is. We're almost at the point where it's like 20,000 systems for the Oculus Rift versus 90 to 100,000 systems mm-hmm. that are Vives. That's a huge difference to overcome but early a lot of in that, the game. A lot of that I don't think is from lack of, of orders. I think it's just from lack of um, Oculus is being shipped. I think the major difference between the systems realistically is just the controllers. Um, I think at some point once the controllers are done and they're going to bring them to retail that they're probably going to retool their offering for the box itself and they're mm-hmm. going to offer probably something that's like 7.99 or maybe 9.99 I don't know. They still depends on how much they they think their controllers are worth. Right. But they're probably going to create a package where you can get all of the things at the same time. Um and then they're going to have selling the controllers separately so that, you know, people who pre-ordered and got it a long time ago but don't have the track controllers are going to pick them up i think where they've gone wrong is their digital rights management and they kind of after gabe newell came out and said this is bad about a week later maybe two weeks later oculus removed their digital rights management check that was checking to see whether or not you actually had uh, an oculus headset on your head or not Let's get into this. This was a big story because we've seen, um, we talked in this last issue, Mm -hmm. we got into this. Yeah. And we talked about how the three big companies were coming together. Mm -hmm. Valve was putting a bunch of money into this to keep it from being exclusive. HTC and OSVR. And they've all said, hey, we're going to put a bunch of money into this to help developers to not be exclusive to one system or the other. Yeah. So you can, you know, the developers can come out and have their their game run on all the systems. And it's yeah. better for you guys, it's better for the consumers. We're going to stop exclusivity here. So there's a consumer led um shift in the landscape. It's called Revive. Um it's being built by a member of the VR community mm-hmm. and it essentially translates calls from the Oculus SDK to the open uh, VR SDK, which is supported on both the, the Vive and on OSVR's headset, mm-hmm. and any other headset that realistically wants to use it. Think of it as like DirectX for VR. Right. So what it was doing is, or what it is doing is, it translates all the commands that come out of a game that's made for the Rift and translates them into something that the Vive can use, and then you can play those games. It works very, very well. Um, And then Oculus decided that they wanted to put in this headset check where whenever you tried to start a game, if you weren't using an Oculus headset, the system would just kick off and tell you no. That's digital rights management. So the OSVR um, developer for Revive, he said, okay, well, I don't want to do this, but I found a way around this digital rights management, which essentially opens up every single game on the Oculus piracy because they could use this hack that he that he made just to bypass this digital rights management check to for the headset which just removed all the digital rights management off all the games so then everybody comes out you know valve comes out or gabe newell comes out and says this is a bad idea open source vr comes out and says this is a bad idea with this exclusivity shit so a couple of days later um oculus finally decided okay we're not going to use hardware checks as a part of our digital rights management on PC in the future. That's a direct quote from Oculus. So they've right. removed that check. Revive works again. There are 34 Vive, uh, uh, there are 34 Oculus games that now work directly with the Vive headset. So they still have their own store and they still have their own digital rights management to make sure that you've bought the game before you can start it up, but they don't care what headset it's going to, which is a step in the right direction. Yes. But it's still a dick move. We kind of knew this. We just discussed this last issue. Mm -hmm. So we already kind of were seeing where they were going to try to push this issue because 
they are getting outsold. And it's, at the end of the day, these are businesses trying to make a buck. Yeah, This is all this is about. You have stockholders that you have to report to. You're trying to make a buck, and you want to make as many bucks as you can for your product. So we knew where this was going, and we kind of discussed that exclusives work on consoles, but not necessarily in the PC market. Yeah. It's just that PC I mean, has never been about this. Exclusivity Exclusivity breeds nothing but the need to continue to go to your same dealer to get your hit. Exactly. That's all it was. That's all it is. And it does. It, it shouldn't matter where the thing comes from. You should just be able to use it. Whether I buy a game on the Oculus Store or I buy it on um, the Steam Store or I buy it on Humble Bundle or you know wherever I get it. If I get it on GOG, there should be legal means for me to be able to use this product on whatever hardware and software that I want to use it on. So I agree. I should be able to pick up an Oculus Rift game and boot it up and have it have a Vive compatible mode in it or be able to make it Vive compatible and vice versa. There's no reason to make, to lock me into using a particular monitor. Yeah, I totally 100% agree with you with that. Um, We, we kind of thought it was a jerk move. I'm glad to see that it's being what, here's what I'm like. I'm glad that the people with the money are, Mm -hmm putting their money where their mouth is and fighting it. Yeah. Um, But that's the thing that's nice about Valve is they are completely independent of that shit. They're not owned by anybody. They are 100% completely and utterly owned in-house. Like, there are no shareholders, there are no stockholders that they need to be beholden to to say, we've got to make this much money. mm -hmm. Valve can do whatever the fuck it wants to do, and that's why they're good. Yeah, and I, I just, I love, and I think we all, anybody that's a PC gamer, anybody that's familiar with Valve as a company, you pretty much love Gabe Newell, okay? He is, Sony fans really love the guy. When he came out, E3 2015, and showed up on the Sony stage and, and sang the praises of a Sony console, people were like, we love you, Gabe! <laughs> Which took a lot, because Gabe is not a guy that sings the praises of any console, so that took a yeah. lot for him to come out with that. So I think that was kind of cool that he's really putting his money where his mouth is. He's really trying to save. VR gaming is still in its infancy, and it's going to get to grow up a nice, safe, healthy way, because people are putting their money there to keep it that way. I like that. Um... What else is going on in the VR marketplace? Anything big? No no major releases. The one game I do want to talk about, mm-hmm. there are some games that we've played. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a fan of the lab, even though the lab is mostly a demo. The lab free. is really well-polished demo. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's the first technically new property that Valve has put out um, since like Dota 2. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's completely free. You just download it off of the Steam store and start it right up. Um, it's got a bunch of little mini games in it. Um, so you can shoot a bow or you can um, run we around. You can do the, and the slingshot game, the which slingshot is my favorite, game. where you can launch. Uh, they were like the cubes from Portal, but they mm. were balls. Yeah. Bowling balls that were like the cubes. They're, they spoke. Uh, they had different personalities. They're cores. They're personality cores. They were amazing. I love that game. I love everything about it. And it was kind of just shooting them at targets and causing explosions and seeing how much damage you could cause. I really could see them going with that. That could go a little bit further. And they recently updated it, so they added in leaderboards, so you can actually see who's the top person at playing that game. Um, and you can try to compete against them and get the higher score. They've got a, 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 a game where you do nothing, but you, one of your hands becomes a spaceship, and you have to dodge and shoot. Yeah, so I played think, that one. Think Galaga, but in like 3D and the ship is your hand. Yeah, 3D Galaga is the best way to describe it. I, uh, 20, 30 minutes I dropped in that. My favorite, I think you know it, Longbow. Yeah. I am Robin Hood at that game. I <laughs> wreck shit at that game. I I actually kind of want a bow and arrow now. I feel like I could I could be the man with a bow and arrow. Mm-hmm. I didn't think I could be. I really think I could put some people to... I could put heads to bed with a bow and arrow. I really believe that now. Um, I like that. I know one thing that we haven't talked about in a while. We're going to go ahead and get into it. We haven't talked about anime. Let's do it. Uh, and the reason I want to kind of bring that up, man, the season is ending for anime. So a lot of shows, um, we're getting ready for summer 2016. 
So a lot of shows are coming to an end. Uh, my anime wrap up this year. Um, I'm going to give you some ratings. So these were some shows that I was kind of watching. Uh, there was one show. It was called Tonkatsu DJ Ag Agarado, um, Agataro. And it was, the animation in this was ugly. And it was about this kid who worked at, you know, a, a Tonkatsu is like a fried pork cutlet. You know, they deep fried and it's battered. It's comfort food in Japan. Mm -hmm. And this kid, uh, he, he was second generation. His dad owned it on this little, you know, pork cutlet shop. His grandfather had one before. And this kid fell in love with hip hop music and wanted to be a DJ. So the anime follows this kid who sees a lot of similarities in the dedication his dad has done to run this restaurant through all these generations and the work that it takes to be a world renowned DJ. The anime, the, the animation on it is ugly. It is just crude, kind of hand-drawn. It looks like something that should have been on Adult Swim. Okay, mm. It does not look like traditional anime, but it was a love letter to hip-hop and to the culture. And it talks about tradition and family values. And, and it did so in a way that while the animation was ugly, I found myself really connecting with the humanity of the characters. All right. So it was a 13-episode run. Um, when this one... I always grade everything on a scale of 1 to 10. 10 being a masterpiece. 1 being, can we shoot the animators? <laughs> and uh, this one started as a 6 because, I'm not going to lie, the animation was that crudely drawn. It yeah. looked like Adult Swim animation. Um, like something on China, Illinois. That So think Brad Neely animation. It was not good-looking animation. This show, I ended up bumping it up to a 7. It's really good. I really, really enjoyed it. It came to an end. Um, I, if you're a fan of hip-hop, of DJ, the culture, definitely an anime I would suggest people watching. Uh, the other one that came to an end, My Hero Academy. This one, uh, Adrian Oliva, Mr. Bro Oliva himself, huge fan of this show, turned me on to it. Uh, another guy, Cameron Hopkins, good friend of ours, he was watching it. So this show came to me. I was going to blow it off. It looked just stupid to me. This kid... It'd be basically a kid wanted to be a superhero. And in this world, and in their world, everybody has superpowers. Everybody. Just just imagine if everybody had superpowers and you were the one kid born normal with no powers. It would be disappointing. You're, all your friends, they can shoot fire, they can shoot ice. These guys are... It would be like in the X-Men universe if everybody was a mutant, but you were the one born with no mutant powers. You'd be a freak. And this kid was ostracized, and he was a freak, and he wanted to be a hero, and... He meets his hero, and his hero would be the equivalent of Superman. And Superman tells him, I can give you my powers, and you can become me. But, yeah, there's a way for me to give you part of these powers, and you're going to be as strong as me. My Hero Academy turned. I, I wasn't going to watch it. But too many people kept coming to me about, you have to watch this show. I will promise you, I've never been so happy to be so wrong about an anime. I did not like the premise. I thought it was stupid. I did want to watch it. I jumped into it. Amazing run. It was, uh, I gave it a seven. It was a seven because I didn't want to go with an eight. An eight's like, really, this is great. This is great. It wasn't great, but it was really good. So a seven. Really good anime. Already announced a season two. So if you are on Hulu, I know Crunch, uh, I think Funimation had this one. So I think the only two places in America, if you weren't, you know, trying to sneak it off the internet, Funimation and, uh, and Hulu both were carrying this one. Great anime. Get caught up on it. Season two is coming. Uh, I thought it was a good one. The Lost Village, which was one we talked about before. I think in issue two, maybe issue one, when we first started talking Sometime about it. Sometime way back in the yeah. past. Very start. We've been doing this for so long now. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to believe. We got we got water under the bridge at this. But oh, yeah. back at the start of when we first started doing the podcast, we talked about The Lost Village. It's come to an end. Um, the season for this one... Um, I gave it a 7 out of 10. It was good. I made, the more I think about it, the ending, if I based it on just the last episode, the last episode was a meh, maybe a 5. So the last episode just dragged the whole score the, down? The last, yeah. So this was a 12-episode run. I really felt like it was a strong story. It was really messing around in the 9 area. Not quite a 10, but it was definitely a 9. The last episode was that meh. Yeah. 
to to the point where most people watched it and overall what you were seeing in reddit groups and posts uh all of you know i told you there was a reddit fan club about it i'd never seen what the fuck so many times in a row that's really how it ended and it's also like a great anime gets drugged down by the last episode and so you kind of just go okay not quite what i expected drug it down i gave it a seven I I could see me probably rating that too high for most people. It's probably going to end up around a six for most people, maybe even a five. It's going to just be middle of the road. You're either going to like it or you're going to hate it. I think most people would enjoy it, but it's nothing earth shattering if you missed it. Um, My favorite was a romantic comedy. My number one favorite anime this season was a show called And You Thought There Is Never a Girl Online, which if if you play online games like World of Warcraft, we know there are a lot of grown ass men running around playing girl characters. Yep. That's how they identify as girl characters in the game. We and just, that's that's the running joke. There are no women on the internet. That and that's the whole beauty of this anime is that, you know, all these hot sexy characters are probably 30, 40 year old men at their house, right? Yeah. Living out these weird fantasies through these characters. This guy, uh the whole story was that he fell in love with a girl while playing this giant game online called legendary age which is very similar to world of warcraft and when he goes to admit his love to this character he they tell him it's a guy oh no yeah and so he being the young impressionable high schooler he is realizes that he had fell in love with a digital character who was really a guy and he decides that he's going to retreat from the real world wants nothing to do with the real world um it's a great premise okay Mm -hmm. The, the humor in it was funny, especially for PC gamers and people that have played, you know, games like World of Warcraft. The humor hits on all those cylinders. What ends up happening is that a female character in the game that he's been grinding missions with really falls in love with him. And she is not only a female, she's a knockout. But she is so detached from reality. She has no use for the real world. She is a total, like, recluse. And she's just, it's it's funny. It was hilarious. So it worked as a romantic comedy. It worked as if you had been in the gaming community and you're kind of used to these jokes. It works on that level. Um, Actually, what's so funny about this is this anime was done by NBC Universal Studios. What? Yes. NBC Universal Studios did this anime with Funimation. Oh. So this was like, you know how you go, dun, 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 the NBC Universal that started off every episode. And the first time I was looking at it, I was like, did I change the channel? I thought I was watching anime. And then it, I realized it, the more I started getting into it, this is this is it. NBC Universal is making a foray into anime. Yeah. So I'm not sure if this was the first one. If it was, way to go, NBC. You got to hit on Maybe Maybe it was just that they were doing distribution because I know a lot of times uh, the distribution of these things in the States is can get a little dicey but here's the thing funimation is a big company you know funimation has no problem bringing i mean some of their biggest hits to our shores you know these guys don't have a problem with that nbc universal is definitely involved in this one and um i'm gonna tell you right now and you thought there's never a girl online was my only anime that got an eight this season wow the only anime I gave it eight to. It was fantastic. Now, I got one that we're going to wrap up this week. Assassination Classroom, second season. The 25th episode of season two is getting ready to come out. I think that uh, that will actually go live tomorrow. Maybe mm-hmm. Friday. It's going to wrap up. The season is, uh, for all practical purposes, the season ended with the last episode, episode 24. But 25 is going to wrap the story up, put a nice little bow on it. I was not disappointed with this season at all worth worth the run worth the ride so we're gonna see where that goes and i'm gonna just take it from there but yeah we'll be back i think next time we come into the studio i'm gonna start talking about some uh i like i'm gonna have a list of animes that people can check out and where they can see them uh summer's getting ready to start so we got some heavy hitters Mm -hmm. coming so i can tell you right now food wars second season that's coming that's a huge manga and anime uh we're gonna get second season of it we're getting the second season of danganronpa which is a very popular game on the vita system you can also get that on pc i've seen it in the steam store second season of that's about to hit that's going to be a heavy hitter and we're going to also get the second half of the unicorn gundam series so it's in, it's halfway mark so we're going to finish out that um i mean there's some heavy hitters coming they're bringing and uh 
as our boy Adrian, Mr. Bro Leva himself, huge Love Live Idol fan, which I've told you about before, how I love little Japanese girls singing songs. <laughs> I don't know why I'm a fan of Japanese girls singing cute pop songs. Um, it's getting a second season. Now, to kind of give you some idea, Love Live Idol, the soundtrack for this anime was in the top 10 on charts in Japan. It's available in iTunes. It's available in the Google Play Store. These th these girls toured. They toured and they were they were knocking Bieber off the charts. Hmm. This is how big their music was. So it's very cute J-pop music uh, based on these high school girls that kind of made a, a singing group to try to save their high school. You know, it's very much not aimed at most guys. Yeah. Huge male following. Huge male following. Guys love it. They have favorite girls. So it's a crazy little anime. It's getting a second season. New group of girls. Preview videos went out this week. I've seen them on YouTube. Uh, so I want to call it, oh uh, gosh, I, I can't think of it. It's Love Live Vital Sunshine. Mm -hmm. I think it's the name of it. This is going to be, get in on the ground floor of that one. It's going to be massive. It's going to be massive. In fact, I want to say this weekend, Mm -hmm. in Corpus Christi at the Anime Con there, they're performing. Hmm. They're going to perform a concert. So it's going to be some stuff. We're going to kind of get into that next episode. I'm going to start getting the summer watch list. Um, man, I really think we kind of covered everything that I wanted to get into. Uh, it wasn't a bad anime season. It was just lackluster. Kinda, it's always what it is. Spring is usually a time where you catch... It's easy to catch a couple to keep you entertained, but they're not dropping the heavy hitters in there. Yeah, it's because it's summertime. People are... Yeah, they know what's about to happen. People are not going to be inside. The weather's starting to warm up. For summer to be getting four heavy hitting anime, I'm in shock. Yeah. I'm really in shock that summer's about to get four big anime. That's not a time for... I guess, you know, there are those people that are the otakus that are never going to leave their house. They're going to be in the air conditioned. I will be one of those people. I'll be in the gym. I watch these on my phone at the gym when I'm working out. So <laughs> I do a lot of cardio and watch a lot of anime. So that'll be it for that, man. But we'll get into those in the coming weeks. Uh, anything we missed this episode? Uh, I think we're going to probably either cover it next episode or sometime down the line. But the Batman versus Superman ultimate cut thingy is coming out soon. So far, uh, what I've heard is... I. I'm I'm buying it on Blu-ray. I'm gonna let you know. Mm -hmm. I know that this week, uh, Play Asia website mm -hmm. out of Japan, really great place to get a lot of overseas games. They've already started announcing their 4K editions of it. Mm -hmm. So 4K versions of this movie are already going to be available. Uh, they're going to have you know premium edition collectors. There's some some big versions of it. My initial thing I've heard from people is that this director's cut is way more violent, makes more sense. That's the initial response. This version fills in all the blanks and makes way more sense. I'm going to watch this version. I'm buying this version. I'm almost, you've seen it already. So I, think I haven't seen the Ultimate Edition. but You I've haven't seen, seen the Ultimate I've Edition. The you saw one. it in the theater. I say we sit down, we watch it, and we go from there. How about that? Okay. We'll watch it, and then we'll come back, and we'll discuss that in a future episode. We definitely got to cover that one. So I think that's going to be huge that we have to talk about that soon. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else? No, I think that's it. Um, man, I, great, man. I, I always feel like we I always feel like we may be leaving something on the table, but I always love sitting here getting with you, man. And once again, we want to thank all the people that have been supporting us um, on iTunes. Our our subscribership is up. We don't want to say a number. We don't want to get a big head. We're very pleasantly shocked that we have subscribers on iTunes and that you guys are tuning in to listen to us and you're subscribing to the show and supporting this dream of ours to help us do what we're doing. Much love to every one of you. We also love hearing from you at goteamlift at gmail.com. Easy. If you have questions about the show, things you want us to cover, we do actually talk to people. Uh, we've been making some moves, trying to get some guests in here. I think that's what's coming next. We're going to get some guest stars on here in the future. Yeah. We've been working toward it. We think we got almost everything in place, and we're starting to line up some people that are really, really, really wanting to get on the microphone with us and like what we're doing. So I think we'll be making some announcements about that. We hadn't finalized everything. We're still in the in the stages of setting up the interviews, and their people are talking to our people, and our people is us. So, <laughs> so that, I think we're, we're getting that all kind of put together and I'm really excited about some of these guest stars we're going to be having in the coming weeks. All right. So 
I have nothing else. You have nothing else. And on that, we just want to thank you guys once again for supporting us. Much love, much peace. This is Roderick McDaniel. And Brandon Bowie. And we want to thank you. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Team Lift Podcast with your hosts, Brandon Bowie and Roderick McDaniel. Join us again next week as we discuss more topics from geek culture. Be sure to follow us on our Twitter page at GoTeamLift, as well as our personal pages at Coach Silky and at Bizeye. You can direct questions and comments to us on our Twitter page, as well as find links to all of our social media outlets. Thank you for listening. See you again next week.